my pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Susan Carey from Harvard University. The reason we invited her is because of her work on the architecture of the human conceptual system, including its development, specifically, which has informed the possible ways in which the cognitive system can embed linguistic architecture. And her work has been extremely useful for us as we navigate our own uh, questions, I mean, ask me in my lab. So here is her one-liner. The most notable one-liner, or maybe two-liner, depending on how you count, I ever received was, I admit I read only the abstract. I am recommending rejecting this paper. The paper was rejected on the basis of the person's three-page review based on reading the abstract only. But the other reviewer screamed in protest before I had finished my letter of protest. The paper was eventually published in the original journal it was submitted to and was the most highly cited paper from that journal that year. <laughs> so, there you have it. Professor Terry. So, Sue, do you know what the journal your The journal was Cognition, and it was Jacques Mailer who had his favorite reviewers. So, it was a, the, the, to the reviewer's credit, he signed the review. Because he said, I can't do this without signing this review. Um, yeah. And Jacques rejected the paper on the basis of that review. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank you, whoever invited me, um, <laughs> um, uh, because I already see from the papers so far that, as I always know, I really should know more linguistics. Um, for the very issues that I really care about. So there's a lot of tutorial going on here for me. Um, <clears throat> I want to sort of s talk about how I see the issues that I've been working on in my whole career related to the ones that you're talking about here. Um, so what are those? I have always been interested in how, how cognitive science can account for the human conceptual repertoire. We're the only animals that can think the thoughts that we can think. Um, we, thoughts formulated in terms of 500,000 words lexicalized in English, most of which other animals don't share. Um, so where does that conceptual repertoire come from? Uh, um, over evolution, over cultural construction, and over ontogenesis. Um, um, the reason it's related here is that meanings are concepts, at, um, at least meanings of words are concepts. Concepts are the constituents of propositions. Sentences express propositions. I mean, this has got to be a problem that's of interest to linguists as well. Um, um, so one way of putting it, how can, flux between what and what, right? Um, and what I want, uh, well, I decided that what I wanted to focus on here, just to sort of address, get you to see how hard this problem is, is that there's actually two kinds of, I would argue, two kinds of concept acquisition processes. Um, and it's, it's really important to distinguish them. It's important for my project. I don't know whether it's important for yours. So that's, that's the question. OK, so just some throat clearing. When I use the, the the term concept. I'm using it as a theoretical term in cognitive science. Uh, it, 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 a concept is a kind of mental representation. Um, and when we appeal to mental representations in cognitive science, this is dead literal. It's not a metaphor. Right? We are claiming that there are symbols in the mind. And symbols what you can ask about symbols is, what is their format? What are they like? like? In fact, if you can't ask that question and bring data to bear on answering it, you're not talking about symbols. 
And how does that format then enable the inferential and conceptual role that the symbols play? Right? So if you're, if you're doing this dead literally, you care about what kind of representational computational structures realize the content that you are attributing on the basis of linguistic or, or behavioral evidence. So I want to illustrate a little bit about how you do that. Um, OK. Um, but we are interested now in the origin. So of course, one premise of this <coughs> workshop is that speakers of a language differ in the meanings they assign to the same linguistic forms, either as a function of context or as a function of different meanings assigned. And that's for sure true in development, right? So, so of course that's true, and it's true in, in very interesting ways among adults as well, um, and, and in different contexts of use. But for sure it's true in development. Um, and so um, the question is, if you have to acquire um, the meanings that are lexicalized in uh, the words in your language. Um, what is that acquisition process like? Um, here's the standard view in cognitive science. And I've got linguists there, philosophers there, psychologists there. And that's Jerry Fodor, Steve Pinker, Ray Jackendorf, George Ray, Josh Tenenbaum, Liz Spelke. This is the standard view. The adult conceptual repertoire is a function of some set of innate primitives, they're the input to learning, and of the combinatorial processes through which new concepts are composed from those primitives. Uh, and learn, these learning processes, their learning processes involve hypothesis formation and confirmation um, and enumerative induction. That's, that's, how, that's what, how the human conceptual uh, repertoire arises. So one and two, the set of innate primitives and whatever the combinatorial processes are, determine a space of possible concepts, the potential adult repertoire. That's the standard view in many, many branches of cognitive science. And Jerry Fodor pointed out, if you accept that view, um, you immediately face, face two really marked <coughs> challenges. One is, It seems that the expressive power of the adult conceptual repertoire is vastly greater from that of a neonate or an 18-month-old. Show how learning could, in principle, increase the expressive power of a representational system on this prior view. Um, it's highly implausible that all concepts in lexicalized and mono, as monomorphemic words like proton, hammer, and wisdom are innate. Show how it's possible to avoid a commitment that all concepts lexicalized as uh, one of the morphemic words are innate. So the second one is harder and easier to see even why he thought that that would be a problem. <laughs> but the first one is very easy to see. So here is what expressive power is. It's a function of the innate primitives and what can be constructed from them using the combinatorial machinery of the language of thought. Here's what learning is. It's characterized by a set of innate primitives and the computational mechanisms through, through which one builds new representations of these primitives. It's the same thing. Learning is constrained by the expressive power. It can't increase the expressive power if, if you accept this standard view in cognitive science. Here's this radical con concept nativism argument. All learning is hypothesis confirmation. I'm going to deny that. Um, new concepts learn via logical constructions from old concepts. I'm going to deny that. Um, Monomorphemic concepts cannot be analyzed as logical constructions. Many linguists would deny that. I mean, they deny his, his conceptual atomism. But what I'm, I'm going to argue is that you get out of his paradox also. I mean, if that's right, then the, his paradox disappears. But I think the more important things is I want to deny that. Um, and therefore, um, to, if you accept his 
atomism, um, then to acquire a new monomorphic concept, uh, a new, one would have to confirm hypotheses already containing it. Um, therefore, none can be learned. Right? So, so, so that's a second um, paradox related to the first one. So, to meet Fodor's challenge, I want to show you that new computational primitives can be learned. He failed to distinguish between a computational primitive and an innate primitive. Um, um, computational primitives are not all innate primitives. So a computational primitive is the smallest constituent of thought um, at any given moment in, in uh, a person's thought. The constituents of phrases and propositions, the ultimate ones. Uh, and a primitives, primitives are constituents of thought that do not arise through learning. Right? Um, those are two do different notions. Um, so when you think about an expressive power, it should be <coughs> expressive power at time one is a function of the computational primitives you have at that moment. Um, and what can be constructed from that using the common machine already of thought. So if it is possible to learn new computational primitives, then you're out of out of Fodor's paradox. And furthermore, okay, so what's learning? There's not one learning process. Some learning is the way that the standard view, um, the standard view expects. Associationist learning, all Bayesian, mm -hmm. hypothesis testing learning is of that sort. Um, I mean, it's very important classes of learning uh, uh, accord with the standard view. Uh, so sometimes involves explicit or implicit hypothesis testing. Um, sometimes the learning mechanism of domain-specific adaptation that responds to information by simply causing a representation of change. There are thousands of learning mechanisms of this sort attested in the ethological literature like learning to avoid a new food um, because you got sick 20 minutes later. Task mapping, mapping the, um, just prints um, a representation of a food that has the computational ro role avoid this. Or indigo bunkings, celestial navigators, learn, they, they navigate by knowing where the North Star is. Um, so they set their they set their path of navigation um, with a computational primitive, the representation of the north star in the in the night sky that um, plays a role in setting your course north or south depending about what your when your hormones tell you which way you want to be going, and they have to learn which is the north star, <laughs> and the reason that they have to learn which is the north star is the Earth tilts on its axis. So 30,000 years ago it was Vega, now it's Polaris. So you have to learn the North Star. How do they learn it? Are they hypothesis testing over the billions of stars <laughs> in, in the thing? Yeah. What, would, what would possibly uh, allow them to set that hypothesis? No, they have a domain-specific learning mechanism that achieves this. Namely, if there's a critical period, it atrophies when its work is done, um, as nestlings, they always have nests where they can see the night sky. And they analyze the center of rotation in the night sky. And they print <laughs> that center of rotation. Because the, the Earth more or less rotates on a north-south axis, that, picks, that, that gets them the north star, or the region of the sky that includes the north star. And the way we know this is we can raise them in a planetarium and make the night, night star, you know, the night sky rotate around any, any axis that you want. And then you measure the direction they fly when, as isolated nestlings, so, so they do this one at a time, um, um, when their hormones say to fly south, and it's of course determined by the center of rotation of what they saw. Okay, so there are thousands of these. And notice what they have. They have an innate computational role, namely what you what you what you want with that representation of primitive navigation in one case, food selection in another. Those two examples, um, um, and they have a learning mechanisms that's designed to learn that and only that. Right? And there's no hypothesis testing. There's no enumerative induction. There's no 
there's no logical um, uh, construction involved. Okay. You don't want to foreclose that these can all interact too. What? These are not all mutually exclusive. They can send them. No, no, no. All of, there's millions of learning mechanisms. And these all can interact with one problem. Possibly, yes. In fact, I think they do. Yes, I think that's right. Um, um, and then sometimes the learning mechanism is a bootstrapping process, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Okay. All right. So. What about conceptual representations? What's an example of an easy case of conceptual representations? Well, rele re relevant to the talks, to the first talk this morning, um, there is a domain-specific <coughs> learning mechanism for learning kind representations. And it's been, been uh, studied by many people. Um, Susan Gelman, John McNamara, Michael Strevin, Sarah Margolis, Ned Block. Um, and it, it, its job is setting up new kind representations upon first encountering an individual with a kind. It supports fast mapping. You learn it from one encounter, and six months later, you can show you still know it. Um, and the way it works, the, the representations that set up is same natural kind as that, where that is filled in with a representation of an exemplar of the kind. And the that there, that representation is what the exemplar views of concept learning are. But the content of this representation is the content, the more important content is this. So what what is what does this domain-specific um, learning mechanism assume about these? And it's incredibly extractive and generative, and you can see this in two results. Um, namely, that you have the expectation that there's an inde indefinite number of individuals that are in the same kind as that, even though you've only seen one. And it's all the machinery of psychological essentialism. You assume that, that that there's some generative process by which a new, new exemplars come into existence. And that jet same generative process um, determines why those new individuals have their kind, important properties. Um, and all of this is up for revision. Right? These are not definitions. Right? These are all of the assumptions you have so far are you take as revisable. Okay? And all of that is part of the innate machinery that, or early development machinery that allows uh, children to learn new kind representations. But when you learn a new kind representation, you've ex increased the expressive power of your language because the, you can't define dog and out of, out of, out of um, primitives that you had. Um, Fodor is right about that. Um, um, so, so you, 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 before you've encountered a dog, you, you, you couldn't even in principle have thought about dogs. Um, so, so it's a genuine case, it's a genuine easy case of creating a new representational primitive that increases the expressive power of your language. Okay. The hard cases, sometimes acquiring new uh, representational primitives is Computational primitives is easy, um, but we also um, acquire them when there isn't already a conceptual role for that representation to fill. Right there, we have a conceptual role for the for for kind representations to fill, um, and it structures aspects of language as we saw this morning. It's a very important conceptual role. It also structures. Um, our whole knowledge base, um, and in these ca in cases of the of conceptual discontinuities, there's a co-construction of both the conceptual role and the computational primitives. This is what makes it hard. Um, and so, if you, uh, what I what I want to, what I'm trying to uh, to convince you of today, is that there is such a thing as this process. Not only is there, it's incredibly common. Um, uh, so 
to do that, I have to give you examples of conceptual system one and conceptual system two with overlapping content and show you that there are propositions that can be expressed in C CS2 which are not expressible in CS1. So I need to convince you that such transitions happen in the development of the conceptual repertoire. And then we can talk about what kind of learning mechanism could possibly achieve this. Okay, so I'm going to give you two kinds of examples. The first one is, whoops, that's supposed to be number, not numbered. <laughs> um, okay, so in this case, there are, a, a, the question is where does the concept, where do concepts like integer or rational number come from? Are they definable in terms of innate primitives? Well, it's an, it's an open question what the innate, whether there are innate primitives with numerical concept, com content. And if so, remember we're taking the representational question seriously. What are they like? If you can care, if, so first you, you see, is, there, is that content attested in early in acquisition or in, in infancy, in fact, in neonates? Um, the, the representational systems that I'm going to show you are attested back to cockroaches. So yes, there are, number is way too important for there not to be some numerical concept re realized in a learner or, an, or a behavior. Um, and what's nice about this example is we know what they're like, right? Um, there's two systems and um, once we know what they're like, we can see they cannot express the concept number, I mean the concept <coughs> integer. Um, I was going to do both integers and fractions, but there's not time. Okay, so here's the example I want. So there's two, two systems of representation with um, numerical content, analog magnitude representations and parallel uh, representations, parallel individuation representations of small sets. Okay. So, and these are characterized by different signatures of limits on them. That's one way to know that they're different. So if you don't know this literature, um, let me give you an example of how the analog magnitude system works. For this to work, I need you to, sh to shout out how many, I want to hear it, so because I, I want you to hear each other. So shout. <coughs> Just look at these, I'm going to show you a set, shout how many dots you think there are on the set. So ready? Okay. If 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 you were a subject in the experiment and you had some experience with this and you'd been calibrated a little bit, so if I'd shown you one of a hundred and said this is a hundred, then what you would have said on average was 16, which is what this was. You all said eight, eight, seven, seven, eight, or nine for this. Um, this I think was 32, and this I think was 24, okay? And you would have said on average, 16, eight, 32, 24. However, the noise around the two bigger ones, would the noise is a function of the magnitude that you're estimating. That is simply the signature of a representational trick that we use all, all over the place, we and other animals, to represent um, continuous variables. And it was, a, it was a surprise that number was one of them. Um, but this is how we represent size, surface area, loudness, brightness. Um, um, what, you, what you create is a symbol in the mind that is an analog function of the quantity being represented, a, a linear or logarithmic function of the quantity being represented, and um, it, the, the, the noise increases linearly with the mean of the quantity being represented in all of those systems. And number, it turns out, is represented that way as well. Okay. 
This example also tells you that you've mapped numerals onto those analog magnitude representations, right? You can, what was leading to your estimate had to be analog magnitude representations because you didn't have time to count those. Um, but you have actually mapped um, um, those analog symbols onto numerals, um, adults have. Okay, so here's how these systems work. Number is represented by a quantity that's linearly or logarithmically related. So I'm saying take, this is the format of the symbol. It's some analog. Um, and um, this is subject, subject to Weber's law. That's just the, the relation between noise and the, the, um, the, the quantity. And so what I've done with lengths there is given you an example of an analog symbol for one, two, three, seven, or eight. And you can see that for lengths, it's harder to discriminate seven and eight than one and two, right? Um, and that's because lengths are also represented with analog ma you know, magnitudes. So, uh, uh, but this is just, just giving you a sense of what this representational system is like. Okay, that's what, uh, as I say, we share that with animals down to cockroaches. Here's another one. Um, and this is, was related to the first ones that were, were studied in infants. By the way, neonates, of course, have the, anal uh, the, the analog magnitude representational system is attested in brand new, <coughs> brand new babies one, 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 one hour long, old. There's um, <laughs> <laughs> a, uh, a, a separate system. So you have two, you have two buckets. I bring up, here's a cracker, here's a cracker, showing to the child, here's a cracker, you're sitting where the child is, here's one, here's two. So the three and one, two and the other, then the mother lets the child go, and the child crawls to the set with three. Um, and if you do this, you have to be crawling for this, um, 10 and 12 month olds, go to the, to the, um, bucket um, with more cracker stuff or more crackers when it's one versus two or two versus three. But the performance falls apart when it's three versus four. Now that could just be the analog magnitude system because I told you um, um, sensitivity is a function of the ratio. And three to four is a harder ratio to discriminate than one to two or two to three. And in fact, the sensitivity of the analog magnitude system at this age is two to three. Mm -hmm. So, so far, that, that could just be the same system that I just was illustrating. But it can't be, because they also fail at three versus six, mm -hmm. two versus four, and even one versus four. Mm -hmm. and this is very striking. So you put one cracker in here, and then you put one, two, three, four crackers in here, and the kids go completely at choice. So what chance? What is going on here? I mean, for any kind of reason, you've drawn more attention to this one, more cracker stuff has gone into this one. For any kind of reason, you should go taking more time over here, you can draw more attention over there, they go completely at chance. Well, what this is, it turns out, this is another very well-studied phenomenon in psychology. Um, this is a working memory representation. What they're making is a model of the crackers, each individual cracker represented by a symbol for that individual. That, these are working memory models of, of attested scenes. Um, which are, are limited by something different from a ratio limit, but rather a set size limit. So at this age, the size of the working memory models that they can create, also at my age, the size that, we, that I can create is three. Whereas most of you can do four. Some of you, the rest of you, are going to be like me. But, but most of you can do four or five, but you can't do any more than that. I mean, it's, it's uh, so in this, so here's a, uh, this is this is a proposal for the actual format. Right? These are object files. These are representations of objects, which are spatially temporally determined entities, in which you can bind, can bind 
information about color, size, shape, kind, if you have kind representations. Um, and there's one symbol for each individual in those models. And here, there's no symbol for integers. Okay, those analog magnitude things were symbols for integers. Here, there's not. Um, however, this is shot through with numerical content because you have to know when one, one object is numerically distinct from another one in order to know to open a new object file. And you can, one computation these representations enter into, is not the only one, but one, is you can compare these models on the basis of one-to-one -one correspondence to know whether you've gotten all the things out of a box, right? So there are numerical computations defined over these, and numerical identity, which is a deeply numerical concept, is implicated in setting up the models to start with. Okay? So the key thing here, here is that there's no symbols for integers in this, or any quantifiers, um, just symbols for individuals. Um, but there's numerical com uh, content implicit in the computations that establish these models and are defined over them. So sometimes the content is only implicit. Okay. So, well, now we've got a description of the only two attested systems of representation that are available early in infancy and over evolutionary time. And we can see that none of either of these have the expressive power to represent integers. Right? They've got genuine numerical content. Um, uh, why not? Well, the, the parallel individuation, there's no symbols for integers at all, but it, it, it can only do up to three implicitly. Right? You can't represent seven in that system of representation. This just can't be uh, a representation of uh, integers. The second one, you can't re represent exactly anything, right? Because these are, the, these are all approximate representations. Um, you can't represent exactly 5 or 15 or 32. And furthermore, it it's not based on, and it actually positively obscures the successor function, successor relation, which is the key to a representation of integers. Um, because um, you compare these based on the ratios. So you don't experience the difference between um, se 7 and 8 as the same as the difference between two and three, right? So it positively obscures um, the, the integer representations. Okay. Explicit symbols for integers arise when cultures invent a count system. There's no culture that, has, that does not have a count system that has a representation for exactly seven or has arithmetic, right? Um, and there's a very interesting big story to be told about the cultural construction of integers, uh, uh, integer list representations of number. Uh, um, and so when explicit symbols for integers, and, uh, and in fact, evidence the ability, the ability to think about integers at all, to think with integers at all, arises only when you when you develop that um, that representational system, which, when it's first learned by children, um, again only implicitly represents the successor function. But once you've learned and understand how to count, you have a system that does in fact represent integers because the, the counting principles, namely you touch things in one-to-one -one correspondence, you always do it in the same order, and you know that the last integer you list, you, you, the last numeral you list, represents the cardinal value of the set, it guarantees that as you march through that, that system, every time you add one to a set, you, you get the next number in the list. So it implicitly implements the successor function, and of course, that gets systematized in mathematics. Um, okay. So my point is that the first thing you want to do, if you, if you think there's some real conceptual construction here, is you have to give a positive characterization of CS1, the conceptual system one, and show how it's different from conceptual two and why it has, it indeed has less, once you understand how those symbols actually work, right? 
how that system actually works. You can show that it can't realize the content that the later system can. Mm -hmm. So that's the first step in establishing uh, a discontinuity. Um, and if this is right, it should be really hard to learn um, over at the genesis as well as over cultural history. And of course, this is true for um, learning the concepts in an explicit arithmetic. Uh, they're not cross-culturally uh, universal. Um, there are languages today where, that don't have a count list um, or where many of the adults in the language don't know the count list, uh, that even if, they, if their language has it. And then you can study their, their numerical cognition and indeed they don't have the concept of an integer. Um, and it's very, very difficult to learn in children. Um, so that just follows from this analysis, but it's in, important to show it. And you want to show, you want to study learning in children if you want to understand what kind of learning mechanism can achieve this, right? Because it can't be co co concatenation of primitives. There's no concatenation of the primitives that you have in those first two systems that could get you integers. So what kind of learning mechanism can do this? Well, it would be useful to watch kids learning it. So, Karen Wynn of your department, just retired. Um, uh, its first, first um, important work um, was um, giving empirical evidence for this continuity that I've just laid out. Um, and um, what she just was studying was what, do ki what meanings do kids assign to the number words they have in their lexicon. So is this a meaning in flux example? Uh, kids can count to 10 um, very often by the time they're two, young two year olds. Um, but what does seven mean for them? What does one mean for them? What does two mean for them? Right? Um, and what she showed with a very simple task, and I'm only going to give you one example. Here. Can you? I'm giving you an example of a one knower. This kid can count to Could ten. Can you give me one horse to play with? Could you put one horse over here for me? Thank you. Could you give me two of those dinosaurs and put them over here? <laughs> And she reliably gives you one when you ask for one. She knows that any number, other number you ask can pass the one. She always gives you more than one if you ask for two, three, four, five, and six. Um, she doesn't have the slightest idea what two means. Um, and she's going to be in that state for eight months. Okay, this child can count to ten. She knows that one refers to one. She knows all the other number words contrast with one. And she doesn't know what those other number of words are, mean. Okay. So um, this is uh, now been studied in many, many different languages um, and many, many different cultures. And uh, a universal these 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 stages of development are universal. Um, after kids become one knowers, six, 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 and this is in a language like English, six or eight months later they become two knowers. Then, then they can give you two when you ask for two, but if you ask them for three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine, they give you a set that's more than two, but not more for, for seven than for three. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so they're not mapping them to analog magnitudes, they just have one means one, two means two, and all the other number of words mean more than that. And then they become three knowers, and they're in that stage for um, a few months. So the, the, these stages get, get faster as you go through. Then they become four knowers. And then they figure out how counting represents number, and they can give you um, the number you ask for for any, uh, any numeral in their count list. 
Those are called cardinal principle knowers. They have learned the trick about how um, that the that the ordinal position in a list uh, represents a cardinal value of a set. Um, not under that description, of course, but that's what the procedure utilizes. Um, okay, so every child who knows the cardinal principles, how counting represents number, has assigned numerical meaning to one, two, three, and four. And that number, that meaning can't come from counting, you know, obviously. So where does it come from? Um, this is hotly debated in the field. Um, um, I'm going to tell you what I think is true without going through the debates. Um, um, so I want to sort of give you a story about these two. I've already just shown you acquiring the concepts that underlie the meanings of verbal numerals is hard. Now I want to talk to you about what makes it possible. So what does underlie the meaning of one through four in the subset number period? These, that's the period where they only know a sub, the meaning of a subset of the numerals in their count list. Uh, I, I think that what they're drawing upon is um, the, and this is work that derives from Paul Bloom's analyses and Karen Wynn's analyses and Dave Barner's and work we've done on cross-linguistic comparisons as well. Um, it draws upon the quantificational resources in language. This is part of what gets them to, to break into the right aspect of language, is the overlap between numerals and determiners and quantifiers. Um, and I think one, that, that, that's using the machinery of parallel individuation, but enriching it with long-term memory models. So this is a literal proposal for what the representations are like. It's not about content. It's about what the representations are like. The content is somehow realizing meanings of one, two, three, and four. But what are the representations that are realizing that content? So I think what they do is create a, a long-term memory model uh, that consists of a single individual. Map that to the word one. Now, why does it mean one instead of that uh, that individual because of how it's then deployed. Um, and it's deployed to label any set that can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with the long-term memory set. Right? So any other set that, that, that stands in one-to-one -one correspondence with this mentally represented, represented set can be called one as well. And similarly for two, you make a representation of a pair of individuals and you deploy it in the same way and similarly with three, et cetera. I was explaining this proposal to a colleague who started to giggle and said, you know, this explains something that my three-year-old did. She was obsessed with um, the word three because she was three. <laughs> and, um, and so she got commented all the time when she noticed three of something. There were three cookies. There were three glasses. She'd say, oh, look, three glasses. Oh, look, three cookies. And every time she said that, she said, oh, look, three glasses, mommy, daddy, me. Oh, look, three cookies, mommy, daddy, me. That's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> um, so they don't, people don't, the kids don't usually expand that, but you can teach children who are two knowers three by just teach, they spontaneously can use figure counting for one and two if they're two knowers, but they don't know how, but they don't know the word three, and they can't also use ex express three this way. Um, but if you, so people have tried to train them to do so, and you, it's hard, it takes a couple weeks. And there's a wonderful video of uh, somebody I know doing such a training study where the kid has finally gotten it, you know, that, oh, three is what this is. And then he says, you know, I always wonder what the reason is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, okay. So this is a proposal. So here's a proposal for what kind of learning we're seeing here. This is only getting you the meanings of one, two, three, and four in the subset number period. Now, how that can't be expanded beyond that because of the limits of parallel individuation. 
right? So, uh, so how do they expand this? So here is the, uh, a bootstrapping proposal. So a number of words in this subset knower are learned directly as quantifiers, not in the context of account routine. How am I doing for time? I'm a, okay, I'm only going to do this one example. Um, we all are all like five more minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll be able to finish this example. Okay. Bad. Um, <laughs> um, because this is a familiar example, maybe to a lot of you, and the other one wouldn't have been. Um, uh, it's supported by enriched parallel individuation and set based quantificational resources of language. Um, one is learned as an explicit marker of sets containing one individual. It's important that a contact overlaps with the singular determiner of. As I mentioned yesterday, if, if you're learning Mandarin Chinese, you become a one-knower six months later than an English child becomes a one-knower, in spite of the fact that you hear uh, cardinal uses literally 10 times more, cardinal uses of numerals 10 times more. Um, um, and if you're learning a language that has um, dual markers, du uh, dual markers like some Slovenian dialects, this is worked by, by Dave Barner, or some dialects of Arabic, you become a new two-knower um, at least six months earlier than you do in English. So, it, I mean, I mean it literally that, that, that the child is built, that just the opposite of what you guys told me about um, uh, the relation between having number words like one and having a singular determiner in the in the in the acquisition process that goes the other way. Okay. So this is this is just the story of para, parallel individuation. Meanwhile, the child has learned the count routine. And the count routine is entirely meaningless in terms of, of numerical content to start with. It's like patty cake, patty cake, one, two, three, four, five. Right? It's just a, a meaningless routine. Um, and, but the child has to notice the identity of the first three words in the counting machine routine, or first four, one, two, three, four. And these four words that they actually do know a, a numerical meaning for. And they have to notice that when you count one, two, three, the number you end on is the number you would use to, to mommy, daddy, me refer to that set. So there's no guarantee that you notice these things, but if you do notice these things, that gives you something to explain. This is a coincidence to explain. So how can you model those meanings in terms of the properties of the count? Um, um, and to do that, modeling, you have to notice an analogy between two very distinct follows relations, next in a count list and next in a series of sets related by plus one, which the resources of parallel individuation can do that within the small sets, not, be, not be beyond them, but, but within them. Um, and if you notice that analogy, then you can come up with this induction if x is followed by y in a count sequence, adding an individual to a, a collection you would call x um, gives you a collection you would call y. But adding an individual is equivalent to adding one, and so that is the induction that we carry further. Now, you don't make that induction upon becoming a CP knower. Kate showed that, that actually there's much more work that needs to be done to systematize the count list. But becoming a CP knower is an important gateway in that process. So the, this is a process that unfolds over literally years, right? Mm -hmm. That conceptual construction is hard, right? Um, okay, there's two roles for language here, as I've just said. Okay. And what you've got is new mo monomorphing at primitives here. Now you have a, a representation that actually is exactly so. Okay. So, uh, this is a way of showing you a learning mechanism that can uh, learn new computational primitives. Um, and there's an implication here for theory of concepts. Um, the importance of conceptual role in determining content. Um, um, and in the easy cases, there are always
poses an innate conceptual role and an innate learning mechanism that creates computational primitives that fulfill that role. In the hard cases that I've studied, um, there's there is the process of co-constructing conceptual role and primitives to play that role. Um, okay. And the second case was an incommensurability. I'm really sorry, I should have just done this one. It's a new work. It's over. but I just want to come to the conclusion so you can see how, how far off I was <laughs> in my estimation. I thought I could do that. Okay. Lessons and questions for me in flux. The lesson is take the representational issue seriously. Do the cognitive science. When you appeal to um, the content of possible world semantics um, in order to do, you know, certainly to do moments. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Right? How is that, you know, what are you what are you committing yourself to? Um, um, how is that content realized in the mind? Um, so that that's important if you if you want when you're talking about different meanings, how do you individuate meanings? Um, um, you, you have to characterize a representational system and then show what kind of difference it is. And then there's a question. Are any these constructions, I mean, they happen in development within intuitive um, theory change, within in, in, in math and intuitive um, mathematics change. They happen in history in terms of explicit theory change and the development of explicit mathematics. Um, are the meaning differences that you're studying ever constructions of this sort? Um, do, I mean, language is a perfect example of what a place what what the what the placeholder structures in 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 the bootstrapping story could be, right? Um, the the reason you know in physics you learn force equals mass times acceleration. Okay. You, that can be expressed in language, it can be expressed in mathematics, and at the outset, when you just learn that, you do not have the Newtonian concept of force yet, or mass, or acceleration. But that placeholder structure is then, then you use that to model the phenomena that you're, that you're studying, and that's how you get those concepts. Right? Um, so language is a perfect medium for these placeholder structures. The count list is expressed in language. Um, but in the kind of phenomena that you're describing, are these meaning changes ever these kinds of constructions? My guess is probably not. Um, my guess is that they are really all expressible in terms of the whatever innate support there is for learning language. But that's a guess. So I, I, you know, I, that is a question I would really love to see you guys take on. But the general lesson is, what I would really like to do is to know more what on earth you have in mind about the mental symbols um, that are underlying the content that you're finding evidence for um, in this, you know, in the kind of papers. continue throughout mm -hmm. development. So, so what, what you, and languages differ in how regular it is. So mm -hmm. apparently in Chinese you count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, mm -hmm. 8, 9, 10, 10, 1, 10, 2, 10, 3 is entirely regular. And children work out that aspect of, so Chinese start six months behind kids and breaking into the system. But they quickly, the curves quickly cross and they develop, develop much faster because understanding 
understanding the how, how the base system represents number is part of coming to really understand that you can do it forever, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, really, and kids don't, English learning kids don't really understand that till age six or seven, that they mm -hmm. understand that the numbers can go on forever. But once you understand the generative um, structure of how base systems work, um, that systematizing that um, partly you know, that procedure um, plays a role in that induction. Um, but a much more profound change is the notion of a number that you get out of this is, is integer. So, you know, so integers are what are articulated in the count list. And that supports intuitive addition, subtraction, and multiplication but not division, because division cannot be expressed as um, repeated subtraction in the same way, at least of whole numbers, um, in the way that addition can be, a multiplication can be seen as repeated addition. And it turns out that understanding division and coming to have a model of rational number is what divides kids who are plus 500 and minus 500 on the SATs, right? It is half of American high school students have not really built a, a model of rational number. Um, and, uh, uh, and so this, the point is there's repeated waves of, uh, and once you've got a concept of num so if you ask a 10 year old, are there any numbers between zero and one? They say no. And then you say, well, what about fractions? And they say, well, fractions aren't numbers. I say, okay, well, that's all right. This is just a semantic issue. Let's call them numbers. So are there any numbers between zero and one? And they say, yes, fractions. <laughs> <laughs> and you say, well, how many are they? And they say, well, there's two or three, there's a third, there's a quarter, there's a half, right? So they literally just do not have a model of, of what fractions really are, of a, you know, a number as in, not yet as dense as real numbers, but infinitely dense nonetheless, mm -hmm. right? So each of those, you know, and, and when you look at, at the mechanisms that underlie that construction, it's a, it, it's a bootstrapping process with the same structure, obviously different placeholder structures and different modeling activities. So, okay. I never thought of this before, but it struck me that with your anecdote about the three, I wonder I was wondering what that meant. I wonder about the role of explicit awareness and aha moments in kind of stuff. You could argue that it's always there. So you, you first get it for three, then you get it for four, then you get it for the whole process. Or is it sort of irrelevant side effect, has no role? What, 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 to what extent do you have to consciously be aware of this kind of system? Yeah, I, think, I don't think you have to be, right? Uh, I think a lot of children aren't. Um, but I think that you, that, um, you often are. So, so it, it's when you look at when you look at the psycho psychological work on conceptual change or conce these conceptual constructions, people think that they're often triggered by noticing an anomaly, right? So that there is there is metaconceptual awareness, um, um, and it's true that if you that we we as human beings are consistency monitors, and when we notice an anomaly, it is a, a um, invitation for further work. But noticing an anomaly doesn't tell you how to resolve the no anomaly, right? And so, so this kind of uh, creating mappings, Reese's macaques do it, parrots do it, right? So I thought that this, this was probably uniquely human, and it's not, and I'm sure they're not doing it under metaconceptual control. They only do it if the mapping is extremely natural. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, so I don't think it has to be. And that mapping is where the new content is coming for, and what's gonna allow you to resolve the analogy. And kids who are doing this all under metaconceptual control, kids with IEF, 
have a big advantage in these kinds of conceptual constructions. So when it's not explicit, the mapping function, the thing that aligns things with the what's the machinery for that? That's what's Same machinery, but what's the occasion for it is the question, yeah. right? Um, so so um, I think that just if you notice the, the cases where, where that's happened, the experimenters have set up such rich parallels, right, that um, it comes for free. Yeah. But the fact that they can do it is still extremely interesting. Thank you very much.